Hello and welcome to Vantage This Week. On this show, we recap the highlights of the week gone by, the biggest stories, the top developments and the newest trends. We saw two major events this week in India. On Monday, it was the consecration of the Ram Temple in Ayodhya, a momentous occasion for devout Hindus everywhere in the world. And the week ended with India's Republic Day, the anniversary of the adoption of India's constitution. Stay tuned to see how both occasions impact modern India. And while India continues to rise, it is also making others jealous. This week we saw two salvos fired at India, one from Canada, the other from Pakistan. We look at both accusations and go into their merits or the lack thereof. And speaking of things lacking merit, a rumor went viral this week about Russian President Vladimir Putin. The rumors say he wants to take Alaska back from the US, but is that really true? Keep watching to find out. And finally, let's talk about tea. Tea has come between the US and the UK again, not in Boston this time, but it has led to a new row. You have all this and more lined up. Let's get started. So the temple is open. Ayodhya is now on the global pilgrimage map. But what does that mean for India? Well, there are two broad implications. One is domestic, the other is global. We'll discuss both tonight. Let's start with the domestic implications. Ayodhya has seen a lot of history. Some of it has been painful and violent. But this temple is like a full stop to that story. It's now time to look forward, to focus on the future. The Prime Minister also talked about it. He said, Ram belongs to everyone. So hopefully, the temple marks the beginning of a new chapter, a chapter of harmony and unity. Secondly, it's an important civilizational milestone. Every Indian probably knows the Ramayana. They also know how important Ayodhya is. It's the birthplace of Lord Ram. So building a temple there symbolizes a lot, sort of like a homecoming for the God. And thirdly, the political implication. In a few months from now, India will head into the general election. Chances are the temple will feature heavily in it. Building it was an election promise of India's ruling party, the BJP. In fact, the party's rise is linked to the Ram Temple. So today's event does have political implications. You will see it play out very soon. That's the domestic impact. Now let's look at the global implications. Number one is soft power. The story of Lord Ram is a pretty famous one, not just in India, but across Asia. You have different versions of the Ramayana. Thailand has one. So does Cambodia, Laos, China, Myanmar, Indonesia, Vietnam. They all have their own versions of the Ramayana. I'll give you an example. There's a city in northern Thailand called Ayutthaya. It was the capital of an ancient Thai kingdom. And where did the name come from? Many historians say Ram's Ayodhya. Even today, Thai kings take the name Rama. In Cambodia, you have the Angkor Wat. Originally, the temple was dedicated to Vishnu. And inside, you can find murals of Ramayana. Wherever Indians went, the Ramayana followed. Like in the Caribbean, in Africa, in Pacific Islands like Fiji. All these places are familiar with Lord Ram. In fact, they celebrate him. So maybe New Delhi can leverage that common thread. Use it to forge closer ties. Which brings us to the second implication, more tourism. Again, the focus is on Asia. It can be on Asia. Look at the top sources of foreign tourists in India. Bangladesh is on top. Then come a lot of Western countries. Malaysia is at number nine. Thailand is at number 11. Other Southeast Asian states do not even feature in the top 20. Maybe the Ramayana can change that. These people grow up listening to stories of Lord Ram. Why wouldn't they want to visit his birthplace or other sites linked to his story? The government of India is already working in this direction. A Ramayana railway circuit has been unveiled. It links places like Ayodhya, Chitrakoot and Baksar. The route has around 15 stops. It's an 18-day journey covering more than 8,000 kilometers. The new Ram temple will put this route on the world map. It could be the star attraction. And do not underestimate religious tourism. People spend a lot of money on it. Saudi Arabia, for instance, earns $20 billion from religious tourism. Their target is to take it to $350 billion in the coming decades. So there is a lot of money to be made. 
And finally, the third implication, power projection. I know it may sound a bit strange here, but just think about it. Some 100 foreign dignitaries were invited to the Ram Temple. Some of them had special messages, like Naur Gilon. He's Israel's ambassador to India. He posted this picture with a replica of the temple. The ambassador congratulated all Indians. He also promised to visit the temple soon. So my point here is quite simple. Today's ceremony coincided with a new chapter of Indian history. Our economy is a bright spot. Our people are young. And diplomatically, we are asserting ourselves. People realize that India is a major power in the making. And in that context, this temple says a lot. Its size, its architecture, and of course, today's grand ceremony. It's an India connected to its past and ready to claim its future. This temple also offers India a great opportunity. We are a proud, secular country, meaning we celebrate today's temple ceremony as we also celebrate our diversity. After all, that is the essence of Ram Rajya, or the kingdom of Ram, a kingdom of harmony, peace, and righteousness. It was a cold day in New Delhi. Most residents woke up to a dense blanket of fog. But things soon warmed up. All thanks to the spirit of 1.4 billion Indians. After all, it is Republic Day today. Not even the cold and fog can keep us down. As you know, Republic Day is steeped in tradition. When it starts, how it starts, what happens when, everything has been decided based on decades of tradition. And today was no different. It started at the National War Memorial. Prime Minister Modi paid his respects to India's brave hearts. He was joined by the three service chiefs. Then, focus shifted to Kartavipat. It was time for the parade. I'm sure most of you watched it live in the morning. But if not, do not worry. We've got you covered. Let's look at the top 10 highlights from this year's parade. French President Emmanuel Macron was the chief guest. His arrival was a break from recent tradition. Normally, the chief guest and the Indian president arrive in limousines. But this time, a horse-drawn carriage was used. Both presidents rode together from Rashtrapati Bhavan. Take a look at this. President Macron and President Murmu using the traditional Indian greeting. Some trivia now. The horse-drawn carriage was last used in 1984. Later that year, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi was assassinated, so the carriage was dropped. It was considered a security issue. But almost 40 years later, it's back. Once Macron and President Murmu arrived, the parade kicked off. First was the national anthem, then a 21-gun salute, and finally, a shower of flower petals. Four helicopters dropped them over the crowd. Next up was the band. 112 women walked down Kartavipat. They played Indian tribal and folk instruments, like the Nagara, Dhol, and Rag Revati. It was the first all-women band to lead this parade. Then came the military. A contingent from France was part of this parade. 95 marching members and 33 band members. They belong to the French Legion. It was established way back in 1831. Today, the Legion has more than 9,500 officers and soldiers. They come from 140 nationalities. 
A French air team was also in New Delhi. One Airbus tanker flew over Kartavipat. It was flanked by two French Rafale jets. Last year, the reverse happened. Prime Minister Modi was chief guest on the French National Day. So an Indian contingent marched in Paris. Today, a French contingent marched in New Delhi. It tells you about the cooperation. Next up was Indian regiments. Some of them are household names by now, like the Madras Regiment, or the Rajputana Rifles, or the Sikh Regiment. All of them were in top form, their fleet moving in perfect harmony. The white gloves rising and falling together. It really is a sight to behold. But today, one marching group stood out. An all-women tri-service group. Again, it was a first for India's Republic Day. Women troops were drawn from all three services, the Army, the Navy and the Air Force. Strength, discipline, the dedication of women officers and unwavering commitment. Every Republic Day parade is built around themes. One of the themes this year was Nari Shakti, meaning the power of women. We saw that with the band. We also saw that with the tri-service contingent. But there was more lined up. A daring display of motorcycle stunts. 265 women were part of this routine. They were drawn from India's paramilitary groups like the CRPF and the BSF. Their stunts depicted the importance of Indian values. Yoga too was featured. Take a look. You'll agree that the choreography requires innumerable hours of practice and exacting standards. And as thrilling as it is to see the sport, we must also warn our viewers not to try this or attempt any of these maneuvers on our roads. Please remember that they are professional riders. So that was the military might. But what's a Republic Day without culture? On 26th January, Kartavya Path is not just a road, it becomes a canvas. All shades of Indian culture find representation on it. And today was no different. One highlight came from the culture ministry. A sari extravaganza. The sari, as you know, is a traditional Indian garment. It, com it comes in many styles, designs, weaves and materials. Every state, every region has a different one. So the culture ministry put on a show. It wasn't a rolling tableau. Instead, it was an installation. Around 1,900 saris were on display, each of them from different corners of India. But don't worry, the rolling tableau did not disappear. There were 26 of them this year. 15 from Indian states, the rest from government organizations and ministries. We'll show you the best ones. The Indian Space Agency had one. Only seems fair after the year they had. The Isro tableau featured their biggest achievements in 2023. Of course, Chandrayaan-3 was on it. So was a tribute to women scientists. The electronics ministry went for artificial intelligence. Their display had a giant robot in front. It highlighted the use of AI in education and healthcare. Then came the Ministry of External Affairs. Their tableau showed off the G20 logo. It also featured the Bharat Mandapam. That's where India hosted the G20 leaders last year. The sides of the tableau had more depictions like India's global digital push and the millet programs. Finally, the states. Again, the focus was on culture and women empowerment. Take a look at our best picks. Now for the finale, the much-awaited fly pass. The Indian Air Force put on a brilliant show. Around 54 aircraft were involved. You had Apache helicopters, the C-17 transport carrier, the Indian-made Tejas fighter jet, your MiGs and Sukhois, and of course, the Dasora Falls. The clouds did play spoil sport at times, but thankfully, we have onboard cameras now, so the pictures are stunning. With that, another parade came to an end. It's the perfect way to celebrate this great country. A bit of culture, a bit of military and might, a bit of science and technology. But in the end, the same idea, the same unwavering belief 
in a young country with an old civilization. We say happy Republic Day to all of you. So to any leader watching, if you want to be India's friend, learn from France. If you don't, learn from Canada. Their campaign against India continues. First, Justin Trudeau accused India of a political assassination. Now he's investigating India for election meddling. And listen to the details. Trudeau had announced a public inquiry last year. There was talk of Chinese meddling in the Canadian election. So the opposition put pressure on the prime minister, but the inquiry was never about India. It was about the likes of Russia and China, countries that have a history of foreign meddling. The US does too, have a history of foreign meddling, but of course Canada would not dare investigate the US. So this probe was focused on Russia and China. How did India enter the picture? Well, officially there is nothing stopping the investigators. The committee can probe any country, but the real reason is this. Let me show you a headline from September last year. Jagmeet Singh wants India included in public inquiry on poll interference. I'm sure most of you know this man. If not, he has two things you should know. A, Jagmeet Singh is a bona fide Khalistani and B, his party is keeping Trudeau in power. Now try connecting the dots. In September, Jagmeet Singh wants India investigated. In January, the inquiry names India. Coincidence? There is no such thing in politics. So what happens next? Public hearings, the first of which will be held on Monday. An interim report is expected in the month of May. The final one will be published by the end of this year. But forget the technical details. Let's focus on the politics. Canada had reasons to investigate China. Multiple reports accused Beijing of helping Trudeau's party. And logically, it makes sense. Because Canada's opposition is fiercely anti-China. So Beijing would want Trudeau in power. And those reports also took names, like Han Dong. Until last year, he was a lawmaker from Trudeau's party. Now he sits in parliament as an independent. Do you know why? Because he reportedly lobbied for China. And that's a credible lead. One that links Justin Trudeau's liberal party to Beijing. But what does Trudeau do? He turns the attention to India. He accuses and investigates New Delhi without proof. Just think about it. India is not China or Russia. We do not have state-sponsored hackers. We do not have shady lobbyists, nor do we have a history of meddling. So the investigation against India is political. It's about sending a message. And the end goal is quite clear, to club India with the likes of China, Russia, and Iran as a country that meddles abroad, a country that targets foreign citizens, and a country that does not respect rules. But let's be clear, that is not India. If anything, it's the other way around. Indian leaders have never called for Canada to be broken up. Canadian leaders have, and that too repeatedly. India has never hosted anti-Canada referendums, but Canada has. Indians have not threatened to kill Canadian diplomats. Again, Canadians have. Yet India is meddling in Canada. It's a bit rich, isn't it? Especially coming from Justin Trudeau. This is a leader who openly comments on foreign elections, like the one in America. At the start, I mentioned the difference between France and Canada. I will show you an example now. Both Macron and Trudeau were recently asked the same question. What if Donald Trump wins the US election? This was the question. Listen to their responses. I've always had the same philosophy. I take the leaders that people give me. I did it with President Trump during his whole term his first term, and we achieved results. We could do important things together. Uh, Mr. Trump uh, represents a certain amount of, uh, of unpredictability, uh, but uh, we uh, will make sure we're pulling together and preparing for whatever eventualities. That's the difference. Macron says, we will do important things with Trump. Trudeau calls Trump unpredictable. He says he will prepare for eventualities, whatever that means. So to recap, Trudeau openly calls a U.S. presidential candidate unpredictable, a candidate he was once caught bad-mouthing on a hot mic. He also brushes aside allegations of Chinese support, yet somehow India is being investigated. Clearly, in Trudeau land, logic does not exist.
There's a new flashpoint between India and Pakistan. Not a fight at the border, though. This one is more diplomatic. Pakistan is accusing India of assassinating its citizens. Two men were killed in two different cities. Islamabad says India did it. Does the claim sound familiar? It should, because that's exactly what Canada's Justin Trudeau did. First, listen to the claim. We have credible evidence of the links between Indian agents and the assassination of two Pakistani nationals on Pakistani soil. These are killings for hire cases involving a sophisticated international setup spread over multiple jurisdictions. Indian agents use technology and safe havens on foreign soil to commit assassinations in Pakistan. They recruited, financed and supported criminals, terrorists and unsuspecting civilians to play defined roles in these assassinations. I know you have a lot of questions, so let's break it down. The two men were killed last year, one in Sialkot. His name was Shahid Latif, a Jaish e Mohammed terrorist. He masterminded the 2016 Pathan Court attack. The second killing was in Rawal Court. A Lashkar terrorist was gunned down in a mosque. His name was Mohammed Riaz. Both men were bona fide terrorists. Now, Islamabad says India plotted their death. And how did India do that? Well, the details are sketchy. Pakistan says an Indian agent in a third country planned the whole thing. Apparently, he recruited assassins, sent them to Pakistan, and then took out the targets. And how has India reacted to this charge? With disdain. New Delhi's statement uses some very harsh words. Listen to this. It is Pakistan's latest attempt at peddling false and malicious anti-India propaganda. India and many other countries have publicly warned Pakistan, cautioning that it would be consumed by its own culture of terror and violence. Pakistan will reap what it sows. It's hard to argue with that. After all, Pakistan is not exactly Shangri-La. Multiple terror groups operate there. Some are aligned with the state, others fight the state. So assassinations are not unheard of. Prime ministers have been assassinated there. Former prime ministers have been assassinated. Governors and judges have been assassinated. So what's a terrorist? Nonetheless, Pakistan has made a charge. So let them prove their case. But I must say, the timing is suspect. Both killings happened last year. In September and October, Pakistan had months to investigate and make the charge. But when do they do it? On the 25th of January, on the eve of India's Republic Day, also their elections are around the corner. Pakistanis will vote on the 8th of February. So making this charge now raises eyebrows. It could be an attempt to discredit India or divert attention. We've seen two similar charges in the last six months. First from Justin Trudeau, then from the US Justice Department. Trudeau used the same words as Pakistan, credible evidence. We are yet to see it. We are yet to see Canada's so-called credible evidence. Let's see if Pakistan does any better. Such allegations could be part of a narrative building campaign. Let me explain. One country accusing you is an aberration. Two raises eyebrows, but the third forms a pattern. Is that what Pakistan is trying to do, to bill India as an irresponsible country, a country that kills people abroad? Their foreign secretary statements reflect that attitude. They fit the pattern of similar cases which have come to light in other countries, including Canada and the United States. Clearly, the Indian network of extrajudicial and, and extraterritorial killings has become a global phenomenon. He says India's killings have become a global phenomenon. How about that? Pakistani terrorists fight in Afghanistan and Syria. Their deep state funds radicalism. Their military has, was neighbors with Osama bin Laden. Yet who do they accuse? India. And talk about priorities. Almost 40% of Pakistan's population is poor. Inflation is near 30%. But their focus is on dead terrorists. We don't know who killed them. But whoever did, did Pakistan a favor, we say. And fortunately, Islamabad doesn't see it that way. For them, two upright citizens have been killed. It will be interesting to see how this story develops, especially in the context of elections. We heard Nawaz Sharif talk about a reset with India. Is this the army's way of saying, don't even think about it? It could be. And that's the unfortunate reality of being Pakistan's neighbor.
In China, the headlines are going from bad to worse. The economy is in decline. Investors are dumping shares. The Hong Kong market is suffering and a panicked Beijing is working on a rescue package. Amid all this turmoil, a familiar face is at work. Jack Ma of the Alibaba fame, who was later persecuted by Beijing. Now, Jack Ma and his allies are back in action. They're buying Alibaba shares. In recent months, Jack Ma has bought shares worth $50 million. His co-founder, Joe Tsai, is also buying. Tsai is the current chairman of Alibaba. Reports say he's picked up shares worth $151 million. So taken together, the total investment is around $200 million. Alibaba, the company, is worth $171 billion. So a $200 million investment may seem small, yet it is creating a lot of buzz. There's curiosity over why Jack Ma and Joe Tsai are doing this. And they haven't spoken about it. But when founders reinvest in their own company, it usually means two things. One purpose is consolidation. After this purchase, Ma and Tsai have become Alibaba's largest shareholders. Do you know who held this position before? SoftBank the Japanese investment giant. So now Jack Ma and Joe Tsai have replaced SoftBank, most likely to strengthen their grip on Alibaba, the company they built. That could be the first reason. The second one could be the business itself. Even if the investors have doubts, the founders believe in Alibaba's potential. So they buy some shares as a mark of confidence. And with this, Jack Ma and Joe Tsai could be sending a signal that despite all the upheaval, Alibaba remains strong, which is also important because recent years have not been kind to this company. Beijing has targeted Alibaba. In 2021, Chinese officials fined it. They said Alibaba is behaving like a monopoly, so it was slapped with a fine, a whopping $2.8 billion. This was unprecedented. Never before had a company like Alibaba been hit with such a large fine, $2.8 billion. Beijing was targeting both the company and its founder, Jack Ma, the superstar CEO. The fine was, in fact, the second blow. The first was the targeting of the Ant Group, an affiliate of Alibaba, a financial services company. In 2020, the Ant Group was about to go public with the world's biggest IPO. The company was valued at over $300 billion, but China torpedoed it. Its crackdown tanked the IPO. Jack Ma came under scrutiny. He was forced to give up control of the Ant Group. And since that crackdown, Jack Ma has been out of public eye in a self-imposed exile of sorts. Before the crackdown, he never shied away from the spotlight. He was famous for concerts like these. Every year, Jack Ma performed for his employees. He dressed up like famous rock stars, the likes of Michael Jackson. His performances were world famous. Jack Ma was China's most celebrated entrepreneur. Beijing's crackdown hit his reputation and pushed him out of the spotlight. So this share purchase is like a comeback of sorts. And the markets agree. When the news became public, Alibaba's share price shot up. It gained $13 billion in value. So in a sinking market, Alibaba shares are outliers. It's also a sign of confidence in Jack Ma. His name still carries weight. So the same can't be said for China and its policymakers. Yesterday, news about a stimulus package broke. Beijing is planning a $278 billion fund to stabilize the markets. And this has been a long-standing demand of investors. They wanted direct intervention from Beijing. It may finally be happening, but will it be enough to win them back? We ask because investors are still skeptical. They believe this package is just temporary relief. They want more from Beijing. Everybody expected the government to help, to do something. Of course, in addition to the uh, crackdown on the big tech, on tutor schools, there, there has been the, a big slump in the property markets. Property market has been in the doldrum for two years now, and many private uh, developers are on the verge of bankruptcy. So uh, the government only launched piecemeal assistance and piecemeal measures, and the, the market was really disappointed. So there's a trust deficit, and this is what you get when you persecute industry titans. China is just paying the price for the mistake of its leaders. It's tough to admit to one's mistakes.
even more so for those in power and especially when they deal with historical wrongs. Just look at Britain. They can't even say sorry or return what they stole from India. 75 years and counting and all they could get themselves to do was express regret for colonial horrors. Well, they should watch this story, the British, and learn from Uganda. The Ugandan president has made a rare admission. Listen to this. Uganda was moving very well in the 1960s. Then we had a man called Idi Amin. I don't know whether you heard of him. He, he was a soldier, a, a British soldier, poor, no education. He, he came and took over the, the government. We decided to fight him. But in a very short time, he expelled our Asians. There were Asian people who had come from Asia and, and, and settled here, especially India, Pakistan. He's referring to events from the 1970s. It was an ugly period for Uganda and for the Indians living there. The country was ruled by a man called Idi Amin. He was a military dictator, also a racist. He seized power in 1971. One year later, in 1972, Amin issued a decree, one that would change the course of Uganda. A sizable Asian population was living in the country. It included some 80,000 Indians and thousands of Pakistanis and Bangladeshis. Together, they were called Asians in Uganda. And in 1972, Idi Amin asked everyone to leave. He gave them an ultimatum to all the Asians. Leave Uganda within 90 days or risk being sent to concentration camps. That's what he said. There was a mass exo exodus that followed. Amin declared a war, not the conventional kind, but an economic war. It would lead to a, to a loot. But why did he declare war against these people? Also, how did so many Indians end up in Uganda? The story dates back to colonial times. Just like India, Uganda too was a British colony. In 1894, the Brits wanted to build a railway network there, so they took some workers from undivided India. They built the railways, and when the job was done, some of them stayed back. Over the years, this community became influential, and at their peak, they owned 90% of Uganda's businesses. By extension, they also accounted for almost 90% of all tax revenues. These Asians, including Indians, were a powerful lot. They ran all kinds of businesses, from stores to banks, supermarkets, and shopping malls. And this community was the backbone of Uganda's economy. Idi Amin did not like that. He called these Asians, and I'm quoting, bloodsuckers. He accused them of hoarding wealth and of denying opportunities to Ugandans, so he decided to eliminate the entire community. Following the typical dictator's script, he framed this order like a holy mission. Idi Amin said that he'd had a dream in which God appeared and ordered him to expel the Asians, so he decided to expel them, and they had no choice but to leave. Many of them ended up in the UK, some returned home to India. New Delhi was upset. It snapped ties with Uganda. The community left behind over 5,000 assets, including businesses, farms, homes, and cars. Idi Amin's government seized all these assets, but it did not change Uganda's fortunes. The country plunged into chaos. The economy collapsed between 1972 and 1975. The GDP of Uganda fell by 5%. The expulsion was supposed to help the people of his country. It only hurt them. According to one claim, the locals were the biggest losers. Idi Amin's rule devastated Uganda. In the years that followed, he would earn the title of butcher. 300,000 people were killed during his regime. He was ultimately overthrown in 1979. That's when Yori Museveni replaced him. And he remains president to this day. He recognizes the role and contribution of Indians and regrets the lost opportunities came into government, we brought back, we gave, we gave back the properties of, of the, our Asian uh, citizens and non-citizens that Idi Amin had taken. We gave them back. I was asking our people, how many factories have been built by our Indian 
returnees. They told me 900, 900 factories they, they had built since they came back. Museveni ended up inviting a lot of the Indians back. Today, there are around 35,000 of them in Uganda, and they have regained their influence. They're active in sectors like manufacturing, trade, banking, tourism, and information technology. Indians are also among the biggest taxpayers in Uganda. Obviously, the government wants more of them. Also, more investment from India and stronger economic ties, which explains the president's statement and his acknowledgement of the historical wrongs. We say he's setting the right example. Now let's turn to Canada's western border. As Russian President Vladimir Putin has allegedly done, the rumor mills are ablaze. Putin is apparently eyeing his next prize. This time he's supposedly going for an old Russian outpost, the U.S. state of Alaska. Yes, the rumors are that Putin wants Alaska back. Alaska was once a part of the Russian Empire, but Moscow sold the land back in 1867 to the still-fledgling country called the United States of America. This was before the Great Rivalry, before the Cold War, before the modern hostilities, and before anything of value had ever been discovered in Alaska. Russia had sold a frozen wasteland to the U.S. for the then princely sum of $7.2 million. But now reports say that Putin is unhappy and that he has declared the sale of Alaska, quote-unquote, illegal. But... This is not true. It's an absurd rumor spread to either incite fear or just grab eyeballs. Either way, there's no truth to it. So why did these rumors begin? Because of a law that Putin signed a few days ago, he signed a decree on the 18th of January. Putin allocated some funds to Russia's Department of Foreign Property. These are to help find, register, and give legal protection to Russian property abroad. It's basically about protecting Russian assets some of which are being held hostage by foreign governments. And this has been the case since Russia invaded Ukraine in 2022. So Putin's order is not really unusual. The Alaska rumors began because of the language of this decree. It mentioned protecting Russian property, including the property of the Soviet Union and the Russian Empire. The Soviet Union fell in December 1991. The Russian Empire lasted between 1721 and 1917. So someone thought Putin wants to claim everything that Russia ever owned from the 1700s till today. And that would include Alaska. This is how the rumor started. And they've even spread to the corridors of the White House. Let me just understand that he signed something today that said the sale of uh, Alaska is uh, illegitimate. Right. Well, I, I think I can I speak for all of us in the in the in the U.S. government to say that uh, certainly he is not getting it back. As if that exchange weren't ridiculous enough, Russia reacted to it. This is a tweet by Dmitry Medvedev. Putin's ally and former Russian president and prime minister, he says, and I'm quoting, according to a State Department representative, Russia is not getting back Alaska, which was sold to the U.S. in the 19th century. This is it then. And we've been waiting for it to be returned any day. Now, war is unavoidable. Please note the laughing emoji at the end. That should mean that World War III is not starting. Not over Alaska at any rate. But while the Russians have been laughing over the Alaska rumors, another historical claim may be no laughing matter. This is Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky making headlines, again over a decree about historical land. The decree is on the territories of the Russian Federation historically inhabited by Ukrainians. He says these lands were once inhabited by Ukrainians, but they stayed with Russia after Ukraine became independent. Now, Zelensky does not want this land back. But he says crimes were committed against the people who lived there. He says Russia systematically destroyed their national identity, and Zelensky wants his country to cooperate with these ethnic Ukrainians in Russia. He wants to revive their Ukrainian identity and counter what he calls Russian propaganda. This is not as alarming as Putin wanting to take back Alaska. But it's a different sort of land grab. Over time, 
the revived ethnic Ukrainians may want to secede from Russia and perhaps join Ukraine someday. Of course, there's no real way for Zelensky to enforce this decree. It's a stunt to drive wedges into Russia's social fabric. But it proves that the rift between Russians and Ukrainians is growing and the wounds may last for years to come. It's Trump mania in the United States. The former president is on a roll. First, he won the Iowa caucus, and now he swept the New Hampshire primary. Trump had just one rival there, former UN ambassador Nikki Haley. She spent a lot of money and time in the state, but Trump was just unbeatable. Let's look at the, first, the numbers first. Trump polled around 54.5% of the votes. Nikki Haley got 43.2%. What does this mean for the presidential race? Well, Trump's nomination looks inevitable. Only a miracle can save Nikki Haley, and the former president knows this. Trump's speech in New Hampshire was very different from the one in Iowa. In Iowa, he called for unity, but this time, we saw the old Trump. No filters, no decorum. Listen in. And I really think this is time now for everybody, our country, to come together. We want to come together. Uh, whether it's Republican or Democrat or liberal or conservative, it would be so nice if we could come together and straighten out the world and straighten out the problems and straighten out all of the death and destruction that we're witnessing. They would not have done the damage that crooked Joe Biden has done to our wonderful country. They would not have done the damage. There's never been anything like it. And you say, are they stupid people? I don't think so, because nobody can cheat that well if they're stupid. Do they hate our country? They must hate our country. So Trump is on the charge. What about Nikki Haley? She's not giving up just yet. Next month is a South Carolina primary. Haley is betting on that. She served as South Carolina's governor from 2011 to 2017. So the hope is she will do better there. This race is far from over. There are dozens of states left to go. And the next one is my sweet state of South Carolina. At one point in this campaign, there were 14 of us running. And we were at 2% in the polls. Well, I'm a fighter. And I'm scrappy. And now we're the last one standing next to Donald Trump. Confidence is good. But Haley's rival is a political giant, and that's our story tonight. Not the primary, not the Republican race, but Donald Trump. How is he still dominating American politics? Can he beat Joe Biden in November? Some trivia first. Only one U.S. politician has served two non-consecutive terms as president, meaning he lost re-election, left the White House, then came back four years later and won again. And that was Grover Cleveland. A very different time, though. Cleveland was president in the late 1800s. Nowadays, losing, losing presidents do not really wait around. You lose re-election, you leave. So Donald Trump is up against history. But his challenges do not end there. Trump also faces some 91 charges in multiple cases. They range from fraud to electoral manipulation. Some states are banning him from the ballot. Yet he's leading every poll. The question is how? What makes this 77-year-old, twice-impeached former president so special? A couple of things. Number one, he's not just leading a political campaign. He's waging a cultural war, a sort of us-versus-them narrative. Whether it's on abortion or immigration or school textbooks or gender rights or homosexuality, Trump has tapped into the conservative mindset. Everyone else is the villain. Number two, the lack of alternatives. In 2023, Ron DeSantis was billed as the next big thing. He was called Trump Light. Later, we saw Vivek Ramaswamy making some waves. He too was called Trump Light. So Republicans don't really have many options. Everyone else is just different shades of Trump. Same for Democrats. 
President Joe Biden is 81 years old. He stumbles, he gets names wrong, and he often gets lost on stage. So compared to him, Trump may look attractive. Reason number three, his unconventional approach. Like I said, Trump faces 91 charges. Normally, candidates would be ashamed of that. They would divert attention from it. Not Trump, though. He wears the charges as a badge of honor, sort of like a battle scar. He's also skipping presidential debates. We've seen five Republican debates so far. Trump has skipped all of them. Who knows, maybe he won't debate Biden either. Finally, reason number four, the state of America as a country, Biden has presided over a tumultuous term. Russia invaded Ukraine, Hamas attacked Israel, and food inflation reached double digits. Obviously, Biden must take the blame for some of it. And Trump keeps hammering on that point. His message is quite simple. Elect me and end the wars. I was the only president in nearly four decades who did not get America into any new conflicts. Instead, I brought our troops and our wonderful children back home. We're at the brink of World War III, just in case anybody doesn't know it. As president, I will bring back peace through strength. Before I even arrive at the Oval Office, I will have the disastrous war between Russia and Ukraine settled. It will be settled quickly. quickly. Now, just to be clear, Trump doesn't have a magic wand. He has not explained how he will end the wars. But in the current climate, voters don't really care. A former president is telling them no more wars. And Republican or Democrat, that's attractive. But can he maintain this momentum? Can he beat Joe Biden in a rematch? Let's look at the opinion polls. Biden has 41% support among U.S. voters, and Donald Trump, he has 48%. That's a seven-point lead for the former president. So on paper, he is in front. But a couple of problems still remain. For starters, polls are not always reliable. In 2011, Barack Obama was trailing behind his rival. The next year, he won handsomely. Also, voters leaving Biden are not flocking to Trump. Most of them are minority voters, like Hispanics and Muslim Americans. They feel Biden is not doing enough to control Israel. So what will they think about Donald Trump, who is Benjamin Netanyahu's best friend? Nothing good. Plus, elections are in November, and voters have a short memory. Maybe by then, the war will be wrapped up. Joe Biden is also betting on women voters. He's built himself as a pro-abortion president. The reason women are being forced to travel across state lines for health care is Donald Trump. The reason their family members are trying to get help them to get threatened with, with prosecution is because of Donald Trump. And the reason their fundamental right has been stripped away is Donald Trump. So it's too early to say. The Biden campaign says they have beaten Trump once and they can do it again. Trump is hoping to be second time lucky. It promises to be a cracking contest. Our last story tonight comes from two countries on the opposite sides of the Atlantic, America and Britain. They find themselves on the opposing ends of a historic debate too, a storm in a teacup, quite literally. Because this debate is over tea, and it is causing quite the stir, especially in the UK, all thanks to a scientist some 5,000 kilometers away in America, chemistry professor Michelle Frankel. She recently released a book on tea in which she said the humble cup of tea could be improved and she suggested that a pinch of salt would help. In case you missed it, I will repeat. She says you should put actual salt in your tea. Why? Because salt contains sodium and it would make the tea less bitter. That's the theory. And that's not all. She also advises that you vigorously squeeze the tea bag while steeping tea. Now she's paying a steep price for her ideas. She has left the Brits at a boiling point. You see, the British are tea-loving creatures, even though it's not their drink. Tea first arrived in Britain from China in the 1650s, but they're quite attached to it, like they are to many other things that are not theirs. Plus, they give themselves credit. The British believe they have perfected the art of making tea. And now they're the third largest tea-drinking nation in the world after Turkey and Ireland. 84% of the UK population drinks tea every day. The UK drinks about 100 million cups of tea per day. 
The beverage is practically a cultural institution in the UK. So when America, the country that famously threw British tea overboard in 1773, tells them how to make tea and asks them to add salt, they don't take it well. The Brits are appalled. And their headlines say it all. The brewing controversy has prompted a diplomatic intervention from the US. They've issued what they call an important statement. The US has issued the statement saying, and I will quote, the unthinkable notion of adding salt to Britain's national drink is not official United States policy and never will be. Tea is the elixir of camaraderie. We cannot stand idly by as such an outrageous proposal threatens the very foundation of our special relationship. <laughs> this made everyone happy. The aggressive headlines say it all. But America could not resist stirring up some trouble as usual. They added that Americans would continue making tea in the microwave and the British government disagreed wholeheartedly. After all, this is not the first time the Americans have trolled Britain. One time, the British even called on their military to clarify their point. So far, no war has been declared over tea, but this bizarre incident makes one thing quite clear. People take their food very seriously. Just take celebrity chef Gordon Ramsay. He loves making idiot sandwiches. Take the Italians, for instance. Just Google Italians mad at food. That's what you type, Italians mad at food, and you'll see what I'm talking about. An influencer actually took up this challenge. He sat at an Italian restaurant cutting spaghetti. The staff were so bothered, they told him off. In another case, he drank wine with ice. They took his glass away. But not just Italy. Food is a big deal in many other countries, especially the traditional cuisine, like in Japan, China, France, India, Spain, and many others, because food is not just about sustenance. It's a part of our culture. And if someone questions it, people won't go down without a fight or kick up a tempest in a teapot. And now let's turn our attention back to India. The nation is celebrating its 75th Republic Day. We told you all about it. But now let's talk about its most enduring symbol, the parade. It's a grand show of India's military might and its cultural diversity. Over the years, the parade has gotten bigger, longer, and more colorful. But like we told you, it's still steeped in tradition. So how did the tradition of the military parade begin? The traces go all the way back to the Mesopotamian civilization. And today, other nations, many other nations like Russia, China, France, North Korea, they all have their own military parades as well. But why do such celebrations include a parade at all? What is the historic link? Our next report tells you. India's Republic Day Parade. It holds a special place in every Indian's heart. And why won't it? The parade is a mark of national pride. It's a grand show of military might and of India's cultural diversity. But how did it all begin? Why do Republic Day celebrations include a parade at all? To answer this, let's go back in history to the Mesopotamian civilization. Mesopotamia was a historical region of West Asia. Accounts mention that the civilization held its own parades. It showcased strong displays of soldiers and weaponry, especially returning warrior kings who marched into the city amid public frenzy. The Romans had something similar. Victorious generals would lead processions into the capital, surrounded by crowds on all sides. And this explains the very purpose of military parades. They were a grand show of force. They put legacies of triumph on display and practically forged it into the minds of onlookers. Military parades were success stories and empires were so successful in fulfilling their goal of showmanship through parades that it gave way to nation-states. In the 19th century, military parades became Europe's national symbols. Prussia, which is modern-day Germany, was reportedly a pioneer of modern-day military parades. They created many formations that are popular even today. And they came up with the goose step in their parades. This is a special marching step that later became the symbol of the Nazi army. All of this can be traced back to Prussia. Now, this tradition of military parades has trickled down to modern nations. France holds a military parade on July 14th every year. They celebrate Bastille Day to commemorate the storming of the Bastille prison in 1789. It set off the French Revolution. 
Last year, India was the guest of honour to the French parade. 6,500 people marched. On display were 94 planes and helicopters, 219 ground vehicles, 200 horses and 86 dogs. Russia holds a parade on Victory Day. It takes place on May 9th every year to celebrate the 1945 defeat of Nazi Germany. Last year, 8,000 troops marched, the lowest since 2008, due to the ongoing Russia-Ukraine war. Meanwhile, North Korea celebrates its Victory Day with a parade too. It's held on July 27th. It marks the end of hostilities in the 1950-53 Korean War. Last year, Pyongyang showcased nuclear-capable missiles and new attack drones at the parade. China holds a parade each year on October 1st. It's one of the most elaborate parades one could witness. For India, it all started during the British rule. Royal parades were commonplace. They projected the British power not only to Indians, but to competing European colonial powers too. When India became a republic in 1950, it adopted the constitution, and this marked the end of India's ties to the British Empire. Now the new republic shed many British traditions, but it decided to reclaim parades. India held a military parade to commemorate the big day. This was a symbol of India's victory over colonial rule. An indication of a new, strong, rising republic, which would not shy away from defending itself. And military parades became an expression of authority and prestige. So, be it Mesopotamia, Prussia or India, when it comes to military parades, all are in step.